Photographic Composition, Lecture 2, The Camera and the Lens, Part 1. The camera is basically an emulation of the human eye. Light is projected at the lens, passes through and is inverted and strikes the film or the sensor at the back of the camera so that it can record the scene, very much the way the human eye works. The first um, projection of imagery was um, affected by the camera obscura, um, which is basically a box or a room with a hole in one side that projects an image of its surroundings on a screen. Light from an external scene passes through the hole and strikes a surface inside where it is reproduced upside down, but with color and perspective preserved. Um, there is a lot of historical precedent for it. Um, it was written about by the Chinese philosopher Mo Ti in 470 and also by Aristotle in 322, both BC. Technological improvements in the early 1600s led to portability. They could move these rooms about. Lenses with adjustable apertures were created. Mirrors were, were used um, in order to project right side up. Um, and wide angle and telephoto lenses came into being. It was used um, in art as a drawing aid to depict realism without distortion. The image can be projected onto paper and can then be traced to produce a highly accurate representation of the original scene. Here we see another version of the same kind of uh, room. This one has two holes placed in it. This is a camera obscura that was built just a few years ago in Norway. And this is one located in San Francisco, San Francisco um, at the ocean. Camera vision. Um, with the use of the, the camera obscura, artists began seeing things differently and recording them differently. Uh, some of the things that were affected by this new vision was the tight use of space, much tighter compositions, asymmetrical compositions, unexpected points of view, exact description of light at precise moments in time, a concentration on what is happening on the edges of the frame, and attention to detail, as you can see here in this Caravaggio. There's a lot of foreshortening with arms um, projecting towards the viewer, um, and also notice the hand coming out of the frame on the right and the elbow of the gentleman on the left. All of this creates a dynamic tension that uh, just wasn't seen in paintings before this time. It's not known whether Vermeer actually used camera obscura, but certainly his compositions suggest that um, he may have, as we can see here. Abelardo Morel is one of a number of photographers who have been using camera obscuras um, recently. Uh, what Morel does is he either checks into a hotel room or finds access to a space, blacks out all of the windows, and um, creates a hole in uh, the covering of one of the windows, uh, either with a lens or without, and projects uh, the Im and an image is projected of the view from of that window from that window onto the facing wall, and uh, naturally this would be inverted uh, because he uses lenses and mirrors. He's able to invert the uh, image um, or not. Some of them are actually upside down. But what we end up with is an image of the image uh, superimposed over whatever it is that's in the room. as you can see here.
And this gives you an idea of what the projection actually looks like, where you see the light coming through the hole on the right and its projected image running along the, the far wall and then onto the wall facing the, um, the hole. This is the first photograph. Joseph Nisifor Nieps, a Frenchman, lived in the country, um, had been experimenting with various uh, materials, light sensitive materials that he would apply to um, various uh, objects, in this case pewter, and um, place his plate um, in a camera obscura and take the cap of, off the lens um, at the front of the camera obscura and leave it for, in this case, eight hours. Um, the light sensitive material that he had placed on um, the pewter plate um, was not terribly sensitive, so it took a long time to expose. We know that it took all day because facing um, buildings uh, have full sunlight on both, uh, on both of them. He then took the plate out and processed it in a solution that would, would stop the process of um, uh, the effects of the light on the light sensitive material. And as a result, we still have this um, image today. It's a very crude image, but um, it was the first, and it was, we had to start someplace, and this was it. This is what the plate actually looks like. As you can see, the image is very faint, but it's enough that the image that I showed you just before is, in fact, visible and um, quite remarkable. All cameras, since the first camera obscura-based cameras, um, have been pretty much the same um, if you break them down to their most basic elements. Um, the earliest cameras uh, were very much like the view camera that you see on the right, um, which is essentially a board with a lens um, attached to it at the front and a um, a ground glass where the film holders will be placed at the back with bellows in between so that you have essentially a dark space between the lens and the film. This is really basically no different than um, an SLR or a DSLR. The only exception really being that um, in order for the image to be right side up um, in a, an SLR, um, it the image passes, is bounced off a mirror and goes through a prism uh, where it can be, then be seen in the, uh, the viewfinder right side up and, and the right way around. Here's an image of a, uh, a view camera that's been set up um, with a view in the background. And one of the things about working with a view camera is that you get to see images much larger, so you get to see them in much more detail than you would in, say, uh, with a 35 millimeter or a um, digital um, single lens reflex camera. The digital single lens reflex camera is, as I mentioned, pretty much the same, with that one exception of the light passing through, striking a mirror, bouncing up into a prism, and then back towards the eyepiece. Um, at the time of exposure, the mirror flips up, and it, that exposes the shutter. The shutter opens, and um, light passes through for whatever duration you decide, and the process is reversed. At the end, the shutter closes, the mirror drops down, and you're back to where you were um, ready to take the next picture. This is just another example of uh, what's actually happening um, inside the camera. Fortunately, like the car, um, we don't need to know how all of this works except that it does. And for the purposes of this class, we're going to be discussing um, 
how you create your images, um, not the science so much, unless you have questions about it, in which case we'll also be discussing that. Medium format is um, just the next step up beyond um, the SLR and DSLR. Um, most of you are probably familiar with Hasselblad, and um, there are other manufacturers um, that make cameras that are capable of much higher resolution than um, the DSLRs that we're familiar with, although the difference between the two is, is shifting rapidly um, as miniaturization and, and other technological improvements occur and um, camera companies uh, develop um, higher and higher resolution DSLRs. This is a photograph by Michael Kenna, who favors the Hasselblad to square format and um, shoots entirely on film. Um, he prefers it because of its resolving power. Um, there's a gradation of tones that um, is just not quite possible um, with a regular DSLR. Um, although, as I mentioned before, this is something that's changing quite rapidly. And Joe Cornish is a British photographer um, who um, has primarily worked in film but is now also shooting digitally. And um, like Kenna, um, he is um, really concerned with the resolution of the images, so he wants to be able to see detail. Um, he wants to see his images in incredible detail. Um, I can only um, kind of convey that um, in this format because um, you're looking at a, uh, a relatively small JPEG um, from a what is more than likely a, an extremely large uh, digital file. 